Tim Ellington, it's for you. All right, here we go. With the Civil Rights Movement, we're in the 1950s, but we gotta backtrack a little bit because this Civil Rights Movement, we can argue, has been going on for quite some time. The N A, the N A. Oh, before that. But you're right in that being an early thing. Now, here's where, again, you can kind of take a deep breath and a sense of relief, unless you're taking the AP exam, where they have to know every single one of these eras, give me a bunch of specific detail on civil rights, and then they have to make like cross comparisons of the tactics and success in each era. You guys, again, just take this in passing and understand that pre-1900 civil rights, this one I bet you know, I bet I taught this to you. What's the first group out there calling for like an end of slavery and equality? Quakers. So the Quakers. You remember the Quakers? And again, don't stretch this, just look at it, get some context down. Abolition, clearly pro-civil rights. You get it trickling into politics with like the Liberty Party, the religious movement for equality. Remember, remember, remember. Ooh, progress, civil rights, you get constitutional amendments, 13, 14, 15. Wow, the Freedmen's Bureau, the government is stepping up doing something for civil rights. Oh, 1876. Remember the election of 1876, the rise of the Redeemers, the compromise of 1877, the emergence of Jim Crow, and you get a decline in civil rights through 1930. In fact, the 1920s, what's the term I gave you for the low point of civil rights? The nadir. the nadir. Despite that, you actually have a couple of names that are trying to fight for civil rights. Krista mentioned one. You didn't mention one? No. Ida Wells is one. Give me another. Who's going to be on this list? Booker T. Washington. Du Bois. Did you mention the organization that's fighting? NAACP. So you know some of this, see? Booker T. Washington, Tuskegee, Du Bois, NAACP, Ida Wells, Harlem, a pocket of progress, right? But oh, the rise of the Klan. So the Klan, birth of a nation, normalized, the you know, Klan's marching on Washington, all sorts of problems. He says it's so bad, let's go back to Africa is his solution. So you following me on some of this context? This one might be a little more of immediate concern to you because it can be on the midterm Friday. To 1947, I think you actually need to know some of the government responses to civil rights. I'm confident you know what Truman does. Integrates the military. He does that by executive order, and don't forget the backlash. When On the he, split of the Democrats, uh, Dixcrats. Which foreshadows there will be major resistance to any type of government action for civil rights. Here's the tougher question. I'm impressed if you got this. What does FDR do for civil rights? Good. If you remember his wife is a constant advocate for civil rights, that's actually going to get you some points. But FDR does one thing. Isn't the first African-American The FEPC, Fair Employment Practice Commission. Okay, so he's the Defense Department Fair Employment, and then who's the... This girl that's his advisor. McLeod? I don't have that name up there, but good if you remember it. So Truman, and then this one, uh, I'm just kind of assuming that you know Jackie Robinson. You've seen the movie, you've heard of Jackie Robinson. So it's like, there's some progress up to 1947. The government's responding, the military's integrated, Major League Baseball's integrated, but that's not much. So there is still racism across the board. There are still problems across the board, and that's where we pick up the story in the 1950s. But first, let me ask, why the 1950s? Why is the Civil Rights Movement in the 1950s? Well, why not the 1940s? World War II, why not the 1930s? Why not the 1920s? Nadir. So the 1950s, the time is right. In part, the time is right because of organization. You have the movement and momentum, the double V campaign, victory over fascism and victory over racism. So it was an awareness of what we were fighting against and the recognition that that's also happening in our backyard. So it's like victory over those things, that's important. Some momentum with the Korean War. And this one's actually interesting. The Soviets use it against us. They're calling out our racism and they're spreading communism by calling out our racism. 
I'll show you an example of that propaganda, which we do kind of respond to. Because what is our grand goal of the 1950s? Beat communism, roll back communism, stop the spread of communism. So if they use our racism to spread communism, we probably need to address that. Want to know what the biggest factor is? What some historians say? TV. You see it with your own eyes. You don't hear it on the radio. You don't read it in a newspaper. You see the violence. And Martin Luther King will use that, especially in Birmingham, Alabama. When they protest in Birmingham, Alabama, they were known to have one of the most racist, brutal, violent police chiefs by the name of Bull Connor. I bet you've seen some of those pictures of the fire hoses ripping the skin off of kids as they kind of tumble down the road, as they're bracing themselves against the wall. That's all televised. As you see police dogs attacking kids, you might look at that in shock and go, whoa, that's happening in the United States? Maybe I should do something about it. So seeing it live is different than reading about it or hearing it on the radio. That's going to be an important factor. And there's organization on many different fronts. I'm going to lean on Quizlet for explaining each of these. I will give you the whirlwind description really, really fast of what these are. Probably too fast for you to write it down, but just try to get the overall picture here, OK? There's organization on many different fronts. There's legal organization. The NAACP fights in the courts, fights racism and segregation in the courts, and has a little bit of success. There's political organization with the Congress on Racial Equality. So there is a political side to organize. There is a religious side as well. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference, it's a huge network of African American churches that is united and organized with protest movements and a clear push for equality. And there's also students, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So look at this organization that emerges in the 50s. Legal, political, religious, and student pushing on many different fronts. You do get momentum. There's some of the propaganda used against us. So the Soviets call us out. It's like Soviet poster. The captions read, under capitalism, Statue of Liberty. Well, that's not freedom. Under socialism equality and happiness. And look, many different shades under the sun. They do call us out for our kind of racism and lack of freedom. And there are a number of examples like that. Logan, question? Yeah, there's only white people in the Soviet Look closely. Yeah, so you see different religions clearly. Uh, I would say Asian, maybe a different group of some sort. Maybe no clear African-American depiction there, but it depends on where that uh, poster was published. Maybe they're trying to promote Asians for socialism, whereas this one might be more of a push in Africa. So th this communist movement is worldwide, and that I would basically say they regionalize their propaganda posters. Make sense? All right, now things are starting to change. You remember the court case, Plessy v. Ferguson. Yes, legalize is separate but equal. We clearly know things are separate but inherently unequal on many different fronts. So everything is segregated, and there's clear inequality across the board. And just kind of look at some of the inequality. Separate schools, separate public facilities, separate buses, separate everything. And African Americans can't change anything because they lost the right to vote. Wait, what? The 15th Amendment was overturned? Why are only 5% registered to vote? Jim Crow. Jim Crow. Give me examples of Jim Crow. Uh, the, yeah. Poll, tax. Poll taxes. Most African Americans in the South are stuck in sharecropping and cannot pay that poll tax. If they could, then they have to read like Shakespearean English and prove it. And to make things even more difficult, to register to vote, it would be open like one day a month from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock in the afternoon. When, you're when most African Americans are working, probably for a boss that will not give them time off. Now, let's say an African American can pay the poll tax, read Shakespearean English, register to vote in that small window, there's still one more major obstacle. They publish your name and address in the newspaper. Hmm. What might happen if your name and address is published? And what's then done about lynching? 
Nothing. There are no anti-lynch laws. So the people killing African Americans, burning them at the stake, hanging them from a tree, nothing is happening to them. I don't think that would work. Harder, easier said than done, because you probably have to show your paperwork and your identification to register. Wait, like, why? Say that. Didn't they get in trouble? Because like, isn't that like killing people? Yes. Like, good question. Why, why didn't they like, get in? Oh, you murdered them. Why didn't they get in trouble for lynching? Is such a good question, and one that is raised. Look at this. One that is raised nearly 200 times in Congress. Congress never passed an anti-lynching law, despite posters like this. The shame of America. Do you know that the United States is the only land on earth where human beings are being burned at the stake? Ida Wells calls it out. Clearly this calls it out, but what group will not pass anti-lynching legislation? The Southern Democrats. The Southern Democrats will filibuster it, despite Ida Wells, despite these posters. And look, not one bill was approved by the Senate because of the powerful opposition of the Southern Democratic voting bloc. When Harry Truman in 1948 gets progressive on civil rights, the Southern Democrats literally stood up and walked out of the convention. They will oppose it. Strom Thurmond spoke for 24 hours in opposition of civil rights progress. In 2005, Congress apologized about this. Like, whoops. In 2005? In 2005, Congress said, we're formally sorry for our failure to enact this and other anti-lynching bills. Now I'm, gonna, uh, I'm about to show you the lynching case that wakes everyone up because this boy's picture is published everywhere. <clears throat> Brace yourself for what you're about to see. It's the lynching of Emmett Till. Have you ever heard of Emmett Till? Yeah. Emmett Till is a 14-year-old African-American from Chicago who goes to the South. He's visiting family in the South. When he's there, He's in like a you know convenience store. He and some friends, they see a white woman and he whistles at her and says, hey baby. Well, that white woman's husband then went to Emmett Till's house, drags him out in the middle of the night and beats him to death, throws him in a pond. That's what it looks like. The body is taken out of the pond. The two men are actually accused of this. The boy's uncle, in trial, under oath, points to the two guys that did it and says, these are the two that took my nephew. I saw them with my own eyes. Now, what do you think is going to happen to those two guys? Again, the before and after, there is kind of a video clip on this. I don't have time to show it. But the two guys right here, there's their jury. Uh, why aren't any African Americans on the jury? Because you have to be registered to vote to be on the jury. So these guys, they end up saying they're not guilty based on the defense that you can't prove that's Emmett Till. That was their defense. They said you can't prove that's Emmett Till. The jury says you're right. They're found not guilty. And then there was mass outrage. This was actually published on the front pages of newspapers Emmett Till's lynched body was the front page of Jet Magazine, and there was a mass movement of outrage, people seeing this with their own eyes, they're calling for some kind of you know, movement, some kind of progress. So this, by the way, the story even gets worse, because a couple years down the road, these two guys are interviewed in a magazine, and you know what they admitted? They killed him? They admitted that they did it, and they laugh about it. <laughs> double jeopardy, he can't be tried twice for the same crime, so they end up getting off. Nothing happens to him. What about like that be new evidence, though? It's not new evidence double jeopardy. because he was still tried. I think you can do like a civil case. I'm not sure. I would have to research more to see if a civil case was done, but criminally, that case was tried. They were found not guilty. Can't do anything. Now, here's the other thing that happens at the exact same time of Emmett Till. So just kind of think, these two events in 1955 wake people up and push towards the civil rights movement. You have the Emmett Till case, and there is a court case that looks at the school system and says separate and equal? Uh, brown. I don't think so. And let's look at some of these pictures. Let's kind of see if things look equal based on these pictures. It's like separate, black school, in the middle of nowhere, one room, lots of different kids. Oh, side by side black school, probably one room with like a hundred kids in it, 
white school, highly structured with desks with equipment. So despite the law, the reality of it was separate and unequal. White school, black school, you kind of see it? Yeah. What about like Mexicans, where would they go? Segregated. There's a big court case Delgado in Texas, Delgado versus Bastrop, that also segregated, that ruled Mexican and, and white integration. Yeah. But there was legal segregation throughout the entire South, Texas included. And yes, they would segregate Mexican as well. So you can kind of see the breakdown geographically of where segregation was, where it was not. Uh, more integrated here in the purplish blue. No segregation in like the, the north, whereas legal segregation there and also allowed there. So is there change in the courts? Is there rapid change in the courts? Here's kind of my story with this. Don't write down these court cases, just look at it. Understand that you get about one Supreme Court ruling per decade. That's slow. This is the NAACP. They're getting progress, but it is slow, tedious, painful process of laying out the law, of trying to integrate, ooh, we integrated juries. Hey, we integrated interstate busing. We integrated law schools, but it's like one ruling per decade. He starts to change a lot of it and you get a new Chief Justice of the Supreme Court that will be Mr. Progressive and will be our new John Marshall. I think you need to know that guy, but first let's note Thurgood Marshall. I will ask you to remember his name. He is an NAACP lawyer who actually becomes the first African American on the Supreme Court. Who is our new Chief Justice? Earl Warren. Let's note Earl Warren. I think you know Earl Warren. Have you heard of Earl Warren, the Warren Court? They're probably gonna have a dozen court cases for you to kind of memorize. That'll be fun for you. I thought uh, John Marshall like, kind of like, was like old-fashioned. John Marshall was in the early 1800s. Well, yeah, but you were like, you said you made John Marshall, John Marshall was like, oh. was Here's my point. Right? Name a Supreme Court justice between John Marshall and Earl Warren. He's an important chief justice. Most of the chief justices we gloss over. In fact, I doubt you could even name me one person on the Supreme Court after John Marshall, right? You can't forget this guy. That's my point of comparison. Oh, wait, the guy went crazy in the ruling over the racist hmm? the, or no, the one who's like, people are, the Dred Scott guy. I don't that know. was Roger Taney, but I don't expect you to remember that. All right, so here's the situation. Brown v. Board will be the landmark decision that overrules Plessy versus Ferguson, and then all is solved and schools are integrated and people live happily ever after, right? No. Why not? Well, you're going to see the wording of this court case is a little bit messed up and overly vague and will allow the South to drag their feet. So let me just say that the court says separate and unequal, without a doubt, schools must integrate oh, with, deliberate with all deliberate speed. Write down with all deliberate speed and see if you know what that means. With all deliberate speed. Hmm. When does Tomball integrate? 70s. 70s. You've seen Remember the Titans, that's Virginia, 1971. This court case is 1955 with all deliberate speed opens the door for defiance and dragging your feet and actually makes the South protest like crazy. Write down the Southern Manifesto, and it's actually a document signed by all Southern congressmen except for three. Don't worry about those names, I just put them there because you might be interested in those names. Al Gore Sr., Lyndon Johnson, and Estes Kefauver, who you don't know, but hmm future president who ends up being very progressive on civil rights refused to protest the ruling of Brown v. Board. The rest of the South, however, they bring back the Confederate flag as a symbol of racism, white supremacy, clear hatred. They fly it, and again, that Confederate flag, that's where it was brought back. It was brought back in 1948 to protest race mixing, to protest integration, and they're using this as a symbol of segregation and clear hatred. So again, just think your way through that. If you ever wonder why the Confederate flag is controversial, this is when it's brought back. 
to protest integration of schools. So you can see, keep city schools white. We want equal but segregation. Communist Jews behind race mixing. Close mixed schools. There's someone with a Confederate flag. You clearly see some issues there. Questions on the Southern Manifesto? Okay, so there is progress, right? Difficult progress, but Emmett Till wakes people up. The Supreme Court has a ruling. Now we have one more major change, and this will be the last thing I cover, and one that they've probably taught you in like 10 different classes throughout your academic career. You know the story of Rosa Parks refuses to give up her seat. This prompts the Montgomery bus boycott and the emergence of what 27-year-old as the leader of the civil rights movement? Martin, Martin, Martin. See, you know the story. So the, the refusal to give up her seat to go to the back, it's challenged in the courts. The courts say no. There is a year-long boycott, and after that year-long boycott, they finally rule to integrate busing in Montgomery. Does that solve all segregation? No, it's integrated busing in Montgomery. So think your way through this. It's like a, a full year struggle of walking to work, uh, of you know doing all of that, simply integrates busing in Montgomery. And oh, by the way, um, it's not exactly a happy ending here with busing in Montgomery being integrated. Will there be any white backlash to it? That's the story with all of this. Don't write down these examples, but understand that it's not like, hey, busing integrated, let's live happily ever after. Uh, there is extreme violence. After busing is integrated and MLK becomes the leader, someone fires a shotgun through his front door. One day after that, on Christmas Eve, white men attack a black teenager as she leaves a bus. Four days later, two buses fired upon by snipers, hitting one pregnant woman. On January 10th, bombs destroy five black churches. KKK is accused and acquitted. Clearly, there is a backlash to this. And that's kind of the story. As we move forward, there will be major resistance, racism, and hatred that is revealed. So that's the struggle that we're dealing with. Eventually, Eisenhower will respond, and that's where I'll get you to tomorrow. Questions? I'm giving you the take-home quiz. Come visit me during a block. I'll work on this with you. I will help you. On the closing question, it says, what would you argue is the greatest concern of Congress in the 1950s, but it wasn't civil rights? It's not civil rights. So Congress does nothing really for civil rights in the 50s. So the greatest concern? Yeah. You got this. What would Congress be concerned about in the 1950s? What is, not civil rights. What is our grand fear? Communism. Communism. Except my closing questions Thursday. They'll probably be. Will I pick them up?